so I, I don't have any disclosures, but I do have a disclaimer that I, I, I put on for every talk I give on COVID, which is to remind people of today's date. So we are April 29th, 2021, in case by May 1st, everything I say has, has evolved. Um, again, the information that I'll review today is based on current knowledge and evidence. And uh, as we have all learned as a, as, a, as a global community, science evolves, it changes, it adapts, it changes its mind, it, it, it reverts again, it, it's, uh, it's uh, mind boggling and so it's uh, never boring. Um, so I, I'd like to start by reminding everyone that we're actually facing two enemies or, or in this global pandemic. So, so our first one is very familiar, you know, I think uh, you show this image to a two-year-old, they would probably recognize it. Um, so SARS-CoV-2, but we are also facing another enemy, which is, um, this is the unknown. And there's still a lot to learn uh, about uh, this infection, this disease, this virus. We have learned tremendously, if you think back at uh, where we were 15, 16 months ago, uh, but there's still a lot to learn. And, and it has been a very humbling experience um, you know, to, to learn uh, about this infection and trying to, to plan and, and trying to, you know, predict the next step. Um, so same thing when we're dealing with COVID-19 vaccines, there are so many different moving parts uh, to it. Um, I have the privilege to sit on a, a variety of COVID-19 vaccine working group or, or committees and uh, the number of issues that we, we want to address, uh, you know, the, the list is just growing every day. Um, and all of these are important, all of these are relevant, and, uh, and, and also of, of, of a variety, varying degrees depending on the population, but uh, they do need to be addressed. And we hopefully are trying to address this with um, evidence and science. Um, so again, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, again, my little black cloud. Uh, I want to remind uh, everyone that we actually don't know the correlates of protection. So the word correlates of protection means that is there a, a marker or a surrogate or something that we can measure that will, will tell us that we um, are able to prevent infection. So for some diseases um, like diphtheria or tetanus or hepatitis B, we have actually a, a number like a uh, an actual quantity of, of antibodies, for example, in, the, in, their, in their blood that we know that if we have that level, then we are protected from uh, disease. So in the case of, of COVID-19, we actually don't know yet the correlates of protection. And another unknown is, is we're starting to learn about protection, uh, immunity, um, but we actually don't know the duration of protection. We are extrapolating uh, from, from different viruses um, and we do have, I guess, real life experience for about 15, 16 months, uh, but no one has five year or 10 year experience with this virus. So we can't tell you that yet. The other thing when we're dealing with COVID-19 vaccine is uh, there's a lot of talk about vaccine efficacy and vaccine effectiveness. And again, we're trying to figure out the degree of protection from the vaccine. Um, but I like to remind people again, it's, it's depending on, on, on what we are measuring. Um, things that were measured or looked at uh, specifically in clinical trials uh, may be different from what, what you know, the, the broader population or the patient or the healthcare provider is looking at. So for example, in um, most of the uh, studies, actually they're not in order, but most of the clinical trials looked at um, vaccine efficacy being the, the degree of um, protection of, against symptomatic disease. So they would have uh, documented infection, confirmed infection, so PCR positive, with a set of predetermined symptoms, whether it's fever, uh, uh, difficulty breathing, et cetera. But uh, some of these studies also looked at um, severe disease and death and prevention of hospitalization, um, but there may have not been enough cases to, to really attribute. In general, there, there are some trends to, to suggest that definitely these, these vaccines are, are actually quite efficacious to prevent severe disease and death and prevent hospitalization. But what about preventing asymptomatic infection? As we've heard, there are some patients, there are some individuals that really have no symptom, but in fact are infected. And then for 
how, what does it mean in terms of preventing transmission? And I say that because we are talking a lot about, you know, what does it mean if I have one dose of a vaccine? Can I, can I go see my unvaccinated or uh, immunocompromised um, household member or friend? Uh, so in terms of preventing transmission, it's still an unknown. The ideal COVID-19 vaccine um, ideally would elicit long lasting, high titer neutralizing antibody I've said the word titers twice, so it's really important. High, high antibody titers. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means, high neutralizing antibody titers. And as well, in an ideal world, would provide what we call sterilizing immunity to prevent disease and onward transmission. So ideally we want, and there are some vaccines that definitely can do that. They can prevent disease, but also uh, decrease carrier status and therefore decreasing transmission. And uh, I didn't put it in, but the next step would be, the next uh, criteria would be a, a safe vaccine. So we'll talk a little bit about immunity to SARS-CoV-2. We're definitely gaining more experience. Um, I'll tell you that the immune system is um, the system that I have the most respect for. Um, I think uh, I'm a bit biased, it's my favorite system, but it is um, very complicated, it's complex, there's multiple aspects to it. Um, there's, there's a lot of redundancy, there's a lot of coordination between different pathways or, or parts of it. Um, but I like to simplify things, I like to put things in boxes, so I'll give you two big boxes today. So first, um, immunity to SARS-CoV-2, uh, I'll tell you there's two big things. Um, first is your innate immunity. So you may have heard this term uh, used. Innate immunity entails to a, a system or a program that everyone is born with it. Um, it includes a variety of barriers. It could be physical barrier like your skin, your epithelium. It could be chemical. So it could be, you know, even your the acidity in your stomach. Um, and it also involves a variety of different, very important cells. Um, they're what I would call the first responders. So at the first sight of danger, they, they arrive very fast. It gets triggered very quickly within minutes or hours. Unfortunately, it doesn't have memory. So it, it's fairly specific. So it, it shouldn't be triggered by anything. It should be triggered by a true danger signal. Um, but the response will be kind of the same with each presentation. It doesn't remember, fine tune it for the next event. Um, so that's innate immunity which is very, very important and very important in the context of SARS-CoV-2. We've had some, um, uh, lots of reports and studies documented uh, individuals who have fulminant severe SARS-CoV-2 that was not expected to be so severe. Um, and in fact, when we dig deep, they have some genetic defect that implies some of their innate immune pathways. So the other uh, big important arm of immune responses um, uh, to SARS-CoV-2, but also other pathogen is your adaptive immunity. So that's your learned program. This is, you, you get adaptive immunity from, from lived experience, either through a natural infection or active immunization. And this category uh, entails antibodies, which we've heard all about. So we like antibodies. So antibodies are very important in adaptive immunity, but it also involves a variety of other specialized cells. Um, it takes a little bit longer to activate your adaptive immunity. And so it usually takes, um, you know, we usually say, you know, seven to 14 days or so a couple of days. And definitely it actually pro, uh, continues to evolve and fine tune itself within weeks and even months. Um, this key feature of adaptive immunity is memory. And so memory, uh, once uh, a pathogen, so SARS-CoV-2 is, is um, presented to the immune system, the adaptive immune response will remember specifically that, um, that viral infection and pre be prepared for the, the next encounter. So it is a very specific uh, uh, immune response. So innate adaptive, sometimes I compare this to innate being your uh, fire uh, smoke signal sprinklers. So it will sense danger, so the smoke and then activate very quickly. It's very effective. Sometimes it's a bit messy. Adaptive, those are your fire firefighters that come in, they um, don't come instantaneously, but they are quite effective and they're targeted. So that's innate and adaptive immunity in a nutshell. So we'll just put innate immunity aside, we'll concentrate on adaptive immunity to SARS-CoV-2. 
And we already talked about a very important part of uh, adaptive immunity, which are your antibodies. And we'll talk a little bit more. There's many different types of antibodies. They're in subtypes, they change over time. But I'd like to introduce you to uh, three other sometimes forgotten members of uh, immune memory or immune uh, immunity. These are your memory B cells. And in fact, memory B cells are produced at the, at the first uh, encounter with the the infection or the vaccine or the antigen. Um, it's a, B cells actually are the types of cells that make antibodies. And so you wanna keep some memory B cells so they, they can uh, make a lot of antibodies at, at another, uh, at the, as a second encounter. So they're like the, the antibody factory. Then we have CD8 T cells. So these are a, a type of cell, these T cells that can actually kill directly. So they, uh, viruses, what they do is that they infect our host cells or human cells. Uh, and so they hide inside the cells, but these CD8 T cells are able to recognize them and actually kill them directly. So these are very cool um, cells. And then we have our CD4 T cells, another subset of T cells, which role is actually to help the B cells uh, make the antibodies. So they're called T helper cells. And there are memory component of both of these, these T cells as well. So again, uh, there's a, this, is, this is your, your A team. This is your, the team you want on your, on your side to help you with adaptive immunity to SARS-CoV-2. This is a bit of a schematic on what happened, just to show you the relationship between innate and adaptive immunity. So innate starts first, then we have adaptive immunity, and then we have viruses that go up. And then again, with hopefully good, effective adaptive immunity, comprised of both your antibodies and your T cells, you will get those viruses out of your system and, uh, and get rid of them and the viral load goes down. Um, this is just to see what happens if you get re-exposed. So this in general, again, on this axis, we have the concentration of antibody over time. And so let's say you get your first exposure and your first infection to SARS-CoV-2, unfortunately. So as you see, it takes a little bit of time before you make the antibodies. There's a bit of a lag. And then you have what we call our primary immune response. So then our, you know, the firefighters are coming in. Um, at the beginning, they're they're, although they're, they're pretty good, they're, they're new. So um, what we call low affinity antibodies. So they're effective, but they're, they're not the most refined um, antibodies. But um, you will make memory subset of B cells, for example, that will remember. And if you are exposed a second time to that same pathogen, they will remember and the immune response will be much stronger, more robust, more fast. You will be producing higher affinity antibodies. And this is what we call the secondary immune response. So not all antibodies are made equally. There are, I won't go through all the details. There's many different subtypes, isotypes, um, but there's a concept of affinity and avidity that I alluded to. So affinity is really the strength of binding between an epitope. Epitope is, is the actual little binding part to, so this is your antibody. It looks like a, well, it looks like that. <laughs> and then it has a binding site uh, to your antigen and epitope is just exactly the, the specific sp uh, spot where it binds. And then avidity is the collective affinity of multiple binding sites. And so each antibody has two binding sites, but sometimes they can hang out together and they can bind a bunch of different um, epitopes and then, and then increase that strength. So it's like teamwork. Um, this is again, another graph, a little bit more fancy that shows you the, what happens over time. So this is again, let's say you get infected with your SARS-CoV-2. And so RNA is the uh, viral load, um, the viral material, uh, viral, um, uh, uh, how much virus you have. And it increases over time. If, if we didn't have any adaptive immunity, this would just go um, you know, out of control and the virus would just continue to replicate. But because we have adaptive immunity, the first antibody that presents is, is in the form of IgM as well as IgA. So again, just to remember there are different types of antibodies that presents uh, initially that they, these generally have a bit of a lower affinity, but they're quite avid. They can hang around together and then bind. Um, and then just to show again, uh, the IgG. So these are the more long-term uh, high affinity antibodies that take a little bit longer to come into play, but they last much longer. They'll plateau and eventually will, will, will decrease. Um, 
you know, they put here, this is possible. So this was just a, an, an extrapolation, a theoretical, you know, is it 54 days, 76 days over years? So there are some infection that we know that can have sustained uh, IgG levels for quite some time, but some, I would say the majority of infection actually, it, it actually goes down. It doesn't mean you're not protected, but it just means that you're not, you know, sustaining the, the, the quantity of, of circulating antibodies.